In the shadow of World War II, a horrific chapter unfolded in the Balkans at the Yasinovitz concentration camp, run not by the Nazis, but by the Ustasha regime of the independent state of Croatia. Yasinovitz stands as a stark reminder of the depths of human cruelty. This camp, less known but equally brutal, was the epitome of the Ustasha's ruthless campaign against Serbs, Jews, Roma, and political dissidents. Yasinovitz was not just a camp, it was a complex of terror, where unspeakable atrocities occurred daily under the guise of ethnic cleansing. The methods employed here were barbaric beyond imagination, characterized by a brutality that even the Nazis found extreme. In this place, the value of human life was reduced to nothing, and the horrors inflicted upon the prisoners were a testament to the darkest sides of human nature. Today we explore why this camp, where the line between life and an unspeakable end is razor thin, is a camp you wouldn't last 24 hours in. Post the First World War, a fresh nation was carved out from several territories of the Austro-Hungarian Empire located in Serbia. This birthed what we now know as Yugoslavia, the home of the Southern Slavs. This nation was a melting pot of diverse ethnic groups like Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, Montenegrin, North Macedonians, Albanians, and Bosnian Muslims. A long-standing issue that plagued these groups was their historical disagreements. Additionally, aside from internal disagreements, there was influence externally. The Turks held a significant reign over Yugoslavia starting from the late 1400s, followed by the Austro-Hungarians who began to gradually displace the Ottoman Turks from the northern territories in the early 1700s. The Balkan Peninsula, home to Serbia, Croatia, and several other nations, is characterized by its harsh and rugged terrain. In many of these areas, power was wielded by those who demonstrated the greatest strength. These vendettas of power were not just petty squabbles, but rather monumental conflicts that further fragmented the society and ensured that unity remained an elusive goal. These feuds often stemmed from disputes about religious beliefs. Predominantly, Catholicism was the main religion in Croatia. On the other hand, Eastern Orthodox Christianity, also widely practiced in Russia and Greece, is the dominant religion in Serbia. Trapped between the Orthodox Serbs and the Catholic Croats were the Bosnian Muslims, Ante Pavlic, a nationalist and politician, was a staunch advocate for increased autonomy for Croatia and he even campaigned for its secession from Yugoslavia. In the kingdom's early years, many Croatians were supportive of this newly formed union. However, when the economic depression hit and nationalist sentiments surged across Europe, particularly in neighboring countries such as Italy and Germany, an increasing number of Croatians began to favor independence. This shift in public sentiment was largely driven by the belief that Croatia could reclaim territories they considered rightfully theirs, notably in Bosnia, only through establishing a military dictatorship. The belief that a militaristic rule was the key to territorial expansion marked a significant turning point in Croatian history. In the year 1929, Pavlic established the Ustasha Croatian Revolutionary Organization, an entity that embraced numerous policies from Mussolini's fascist Italy. During this period, Pavlic and his advocates, Hitler and Mussolini, were not the dominant force in Croatia. However, as the political climate in Europe deteriorated and both Germany and Italy seemed indomitable, a surge of Croatians started to affiliate themselves with Pavlic's organization. Mirroring the societal divisions seen in Italy, Germany, and France on the verge of war, Croatia too found itself polarized. On one end of the spectrum were the Ustasha and other nationalist factions, while on the opposite end stood Croatian socialists and communists. As tensions escalated, King Alexander I of Yugoslavia took decisive action to outlaw nationalist movements across various Yugoslav states in pursuit of maintaining national unity. In a shocking turn of events in 1934, Ustasha's sympathizers assassinated King Alexander, a Serb, during his diplomatic visit to France. It paved the way throughout the 1930s for the Ustasha to carry out a campaign of terror within Croatia and Bosnia. Their objective was to generate instability within these regions thereby creating an opportunity for them to seize power. They wanted Croatia to be solely for Croatians who followed Catholicism and believed that all other groups such as Jews, Serbs, and Roma should be inferior. In 1942, Yugoslavia was under the governance of Prince Paul, who had pro-German leanings. Hitler pressured him to permit German troops to traverse through his country, aiming to aid Mussolini in his Greek invasion, a request which Paul nearly conceded to. However, Peter II, still in his teenage years and backed by the British military, contested his cousin Paul's rule 
and declined Hitler's demand. This act of defiance prompted Hitler to call for punitive measures and resulted in the invasion of Yugoslavia. This invasion, along with the guerrilla warfare that ensued in Yugoslavia, was among the most savage of the war period. Many prisoner camps were established during this time, with the initial one being erected in 1941. This first camp was operational for a mere three months, yet within this short duration, thousands of Serbs and Croatian Jews lost their lives. While it is believed that the victim count ranges from 10,000 to 70,000 individuals, a precise number is challenging to ascertain due to many victims going uncounted. Between the years of 1941 and 1945, with Croatia still being under the oppressive rule of Ustasha, many brutal camps were established by this fascist group. By the time the Asinovitz complex was constructed, with its five sprawling camps along the Sava River, it was not just a symbol of oppression, but a machine of death, operating under the guise of a labor facility. Here, the Ustasha's perverse social order was manifested in the most grotesque ways, as killing became a ladder to power and status. Fueled by a twisted sense of patriotic duty, they sought to eliminate all they believed to be inferior, a cleansing of the soul of the nation through the most barbaric of means. Yasinovac's Brutality Unveiled The older populace of Croatia was deemed tainted by liberal views or Yugoslav philosophies. So, it was the younger generation, having demonstrated their loyalty, that was considered suitable for the new Croatian state under Ustasha's leadership. For this reason, Jasinovac and other camps were run by young Croatians. It was a cleverly orchestrated plan to identify those willing to perpetrate horrific crimes in the name of their homeland. Innocent lives were snuffed out, either right at their doorsteps or just a few hundred meters away from their homes. These were victims who never even made it to the camp. The intent was not just to eliminate them, but also to instill fear into the hearts of others, demonstrating the extent of the regime's power and ruthlessness. In the beginning, basic devices of extermination that utilized car exhaust fumes to eliminate victims were used. However, this approach was deemed too unreliable and ineffective, leading the Croatians to turn to more immediate and savage methods. Countless victims were thrown off cliffs, beaten until their last breath, or had their necks severed. Entire communities were razed to ashes. People were forced into fatal marches in the depths of winter, while others fell victim to deliberate starvation. These slayings were examples of brutal and random savagery that set new precedents in our shared history. It's reported that some Croatian Catholic priests were put to death for their refusal to participate in these mass killings, though records also show instances of forced compliance. A significant number participated out of fear for their own lives, often being armed and committing heinous acts themselves. In an environment that welcomed cruelty, they did not disappoint. They turned to shooting prisoners, binding men, women, and children together and submerging them in lakes, frequently subjecting them to sexual abuse prior to their execution. They inflicted fatal injuries by beating, dismemberment, disembowelment, and established a system of torture too horrendous to articulate. While brutalities were found in many concentration camps, the infamy of Yasinovets comes from the individuals who orchestrated these atrocities and the unique extermination techniques they devised. Miroslav Filipovich Maistorovich and Vyekoslav Luburic are among the most infamous figures associated with this chapter of history. Filipovich Maistorovich, a monk, took perverse pleasure in methodically slitting prisoners' throats with a handheld agricultural implement, boasting of personally ending thousands of lives. Luburic, a merciless member of the independent state of Croatia, was known for his horrifying morning ritual of beating a child to death, and he would coerce other guards into following suit. Those who dared to defy his orders would face severe reprisals, including being made to join the ranks of the prisoners or being dispatched to the front lines. Following the war, justice caught up with Filipovic Maistorovic, who was apprehended and subsequently hanged for his heinous crimes. Luburic, however, managed to evade immediate retribution and fled to Spain. He was eventually tracked down and executed by Yugoslav agents in 1969, who reportedly utilized hammers to deliver a brutal end, reminiscent of his own cruel methods. Within the confines of Yasinovitz, the basic necessities of life were a distant dream. The prisoners, stripped of their dignity, were subjected to conditions so appalling that mere survival was a feat of human endurance. Meager rations barely sustained them, while housing and sanitation facilities were so inadequate 
they seemed an afterthought to their captors. The cruelty inflicted by the wardens knew no bounds. Torture, arbitrary killings, and psychological terror were the order of the day. It was a reign of terror so brutal, so devoid of humanity, that even the notorious Nazis found themselves taken aback, pressing the Croatian authorities to close these hellish sites. In the subcamps, the scenes were of absolute horror. Prisoners were crammed into bunkers, shackled to one another, their personal space invaded not just by fellow inmates, but by vermin and the stench of death. Forced labor was a respite compared to the squalor they returned to, environments so vile, so rat-infested, that the presence of decaying corpses became a grim part of the landscape. Latrines, if they could be called that, were monstrous pits of human waste, three meters deep, another tool for the guards' sadistic games. For the trapped souls within Yasinovitz, being pushed into one of these cesspools was a real and terrifying prospect, a perverse form of entertainment for their captors, a spectacle of suffering and despair. Could you survive? Ultimately, the Nazi allies who visited Yasinovitz applied pressure on the independent state of Croatia, culminating in the shutting down of the camp. The death toll at Yasinovitz is believed to fluctuate between 100,000 and 150,000 lives. However, if we take into account all the deaths attributed to the Ustasha regime, the count escalates to approximately 400,000. The deceased were disposed of into deep pits, and even to this day, skeletal remains continue to surface. The brutal reality is that survival rates were incredibly low, and the camp's history is a stark reminder of the cruelty humans can inflict on one another. Being placed in such a situation without the skills or means to endure the extreme physical and psychological abuse, let alone the meager chances of escape, would make survival beyond a mere 24 hours a grim prospect. This is History on Fleet, and we'll see you next time.